All right, so good morning. Today we're going to finish our module 26. Also, we could call it 6.1, and we'll finish talking about classical conditioning and its associated phenomena. And then our next lecture, we'll talk about operant conditioning. Okay, so here is a real life classical conditioning example that applies to me. So, as I've told you before, I have a fear of birds, which the technical term is, term is ornithophobia. Now, we're going to break down my fear of birds and how I acquired this fear according to classical conditioning terms, okay? So, remember with an unconditioned stimulus <clears throat> and an unconditioned response, it has to be something that basically happens naturally, almost reflexively. So, for example, for most people, getting bitten causes some type of fear reaction. It's not you know, naturally we want to kind of jerk away. So getting bitten would be our unconditioned stimulus here for me. The unconditioned response, you know, this natural response to the unconditioned stimulus would be fear, a fear reaction. So getting bitten naturally causes you to feel afraid, okay, especially when you're a child. Now, let's take in our neutral stimulus now, okay? Something that I did not have any associations with prior. So now I see the bird, okay? This is my neutral stimulus. I see the bird, I get bitten by the bird, and then I have a fear reaction. So my neutral stimulus here would now be the sight of the bird. Now with most classical conditioning trials, you would have to repeat this experience over and over, but with things that are very emotionally triggering, sometimes it only has to happen once, um, especially for like things that involve fear. So eventually, because this the sight of the bird paired with the biting from the bird causes such a big fear reaction in me, that neutral stimulus immediately became a conditioned stimulus. So Eventually, me just seeing a bird leads to me being afraid, okay? So this is how that works. So the sight of the bird, which at once was a neutral stimulus, because it got paired with my unconditioned stimulus of being bitten, it becomes <clears throat> the conditioned stimulus, which leads to the conditioned response. If you notice, the conditioned response does not change, okay? The only thing that is changing here really is the condition stimulus. It's moving from a neutral stimulus to a condition stimulus. So something to note. Now, if you can, I would like you, if you have a certain fear of something, try to apply your fear with these terms in your notes, okay? All right, so there are a few different um, terms or phenomena that can kind of occur in relation to classical conditioning. The first is called acquisition. So acquisition is that initial learning stage that basically causes the neutral stimulus to become the conditioned stimulus. So like I was talking about with my bird example, when seeing a bird caused me to be afraid, that was the acquisition period. So Pavlov wanted to know if he presented the unconditioned stimulus before the neutral stimulus, would acquisition occur? So let's say a bird bit me and then I saw a bird, which that doesn't work perfectly, but a bird bit me, I see a bird, would I get scared of birds? It would not actually be as likely um, than if I saw a bird, then I got bitten then I cause fear because our brain makes associations and it makes predictions. So maybe another example is like <clears throat> with my taste aversion example, I don't like tart plain frozen yogurt because I puked it up one time in, in eighth grade because I got really sick. So because I got sick and then I, um, because I ate frozen yogurt and then I puked, I associated frozen yogurt with puking. Now, let's say I puked, and then the next day I ate frozen yogurt. I would not associate those two together. That's what it means. So classical conditioning requires a natural response to begin with, like we've talked about. Like It has to be kind of like 
almost an innate response, kind of uh, like a reflex or um, uh, instinct almost. Because if it's not that, if it's not causing this innate response or natural response, it's a different type of conditioning, which we'll talk about. It could be operant conditioning or something else. So the major takeaway is that conditioning helps an animal survive and reproduce. Um, by responding to cues that help it gain food, avoid dangers, locate mates, and produce offspring, right? So both of my examples, right? Avoiding danger. Because when I was sick with the uh, yogurt, <laughs> which I puked up, I wasn't sick from the yogurt, but my brain associated it that way to keep me safe, to avoid that food, because maybe my brain thinks, oh, that's poisonous. Same thing with birds. I was afraid because I was bitten by a bird. This is to keep me out of danger, okay? Even though it's not technically a danger now, as a child, it was a danger to me and my brain. So I learned that phenomenon to help keep me safe. Okay, so here are some other terms that you need to know. Um, one term is called higher order conditioning. So it's also called like secondary conditioning, basically. So higher order conditioning is when a new neutral stimulus can become a con uh, conditioned stimulus without the presence of a UCS. So let's talk about, let's say with the bell and the dog situation. So let's say I wanted the dogs are conditioned to salivate to the sound of a, a bell, right? Okay, so our conditioned stimulus is the bell. Now let's say I want to condition them to um, salivate to a light flicker, okay? So what I would do is I would have my light flickering, which would be a neutral stimulus. I would pair that with the tone, which is already a conditioned stimulus, which would evoke salivation. Eventually the light flickering alone should also result in salivation. However, it's not as strong and not as predictable as first order conditioning, um, which would be just the bell on its own. So that's higher order conditioning. Another thing that can happen with classical conditioning is like our little doggy says here, to hell with your bell. Um, extinction occurs basically if if let's say Pavlov kept ringing the bell over and over and over again and wasn't giving food afterwards enough, the dogs would stop salivating to the bell. And that's called extinction. Basically when the condition response diminishes or goes away because the unconditioned stimulus isn't um, following the conditioned stimulus. So if they're not getting food, uh, which would cause salivation after the bell for a long enough period of time, they're going to lose that learning or they're just not going to exhibit that learning as often. And then also there's another thing, funny thing that can happen called spontaneous recovery. So little doggy says to hell with your bell. I don't care about uh, the spell anymore and I'm not going to salivate. Obviously they're not doing this consciously, but you know what I mean? I'm not going to salivate anymore to just the sound of a bell. Well, sometimes, even after extinction occurs, maybe Pavlov rings that bell a week later, and boom, they start salivating just to the sound of the bell again. This is called spontaneous recovery. So these are some funky little things that can happen with classical conditioning. Here are some more things that can happen with classical conditioning. So another thing that can happen is called generalization, where we um, have this tendency to respond to stimuli that are all similar to the conditioned stimulus. So like with my example with birds, it was a goose, <laughs> right? A goose that um, bit me, I think, or a duck, I can't remember. Um, but it was one of those kinds of birds, something you would see at a park or like a petting zoo. And yet my fear does not only apply to ducks and geese, it applies to all birds. This is an example of generalization where I am now conditioned to avoid or be fearful of all birds. Then we have discrimination and with discrimination here, we are not talking about human discrimination like prejudice. 
that has nothing to do with what this means. Discrimination here means you are able to discriminate or tell a difference between two similar stimuli and you only respond to the correct one. So um, let's say uh, I, if I didn't generalize my fear of birds, what would happen if I was using, if um, my brain produced discrimination, I would only be afraid of ducks or geese and not any other birds. That would be an example of discrimination. Another example of discrimination would be with like Pavlov's dogs, that they would recognize the tones that do result in food and respond to those, but would not respond to the ones that don't give them food. Okay. And then um, there's also this thing called the blocking effect. We won't go really far deep into this because it's only in our textbook, it's not in other textbooks. But let's say you train a rat to react to a light with a shock. So this rat is trained to react to light with a shock. So light happens, shock happens, so they're gonna get, they're gonna go frozen. Now let's say a tone is added. Um, basically reactions to the tone will not occur. Um, so the previously established association to one stimulus blocks the formation of an association to the added stimulus. So it's kind of like what we were talking about with the higher order conditioning, but in the opposite way. So if they paired the light with the tone and then the shock, it's not going to predict anything new for these, for the, you know, animal in question or human in question. So they're not going to learn that the tone, uh, predicts anything. They're not going to act in fear according to the tone because they already have the, the learning to the light. Okay. So Pavlov's legacy, these are some things you should know about Pavlov. Um, he demonstrated that many responses to stimuli can be classically conditioned in many other organisms. So it's not just dogs, it's a ton of animals. He also demonstrated that processes can be studied objectively. Things that are complex like learning, we can actually look at those um, by looking at an organism's behavior. And that's the whole kind of goal of the behavioral movement or behavioral perspective is we want to study things that we can actually objectively see and measure. And that's the behaviorism kind of idea. Now, here are some applications of classical conditioning. Sorry, I'm going to move, move me a little bit. Oh, why do I, why do I get so big? Okay, well, whatever. So here's some applications of classical conditioning. One thing is drug cravings. Um, when a person uses drugs, um, especially addictive drugs, when they're going through withdrawal, it's it's an example of classical conditioning because they're they're basically craving that condition response, which when they inject the drug, it causes this feeling and so then that's their conditioned response so then they will crave drugs um, another thing is food cravings so like sugar sugar is a very yummy hard thing to recondition oneself if you have a very unhealthy diet that's focused on eating sugary foods because when the brain is being stimulated over and over and over again that pleasure center that dopamine reward center which sugar stimulates uh, it's very hard to go against that. It's very hard to train yourself to not want that. Um, and that's because your brain has associated, mm, sugar equals my brain feels good for a few minutes. So it's very hard to recondition that. Another interesting thing is um, classical conditioning can apply to immune responses. So when a taste accompanies a drug, that influences immune responses, the taste itself can come to produce an immune response. So for example, there was this really disgusting, um, like, I don't know if you guys ever took it when you were little, but there was this medicine, this liquid medicine I would take when I was a kid, when I was like sick, maybe I had an infection or something, but it was this white, liquidy, disgusting, kind of chalky flavor medicine. And just the taste of that alone could end up helping you to basically feel better causing that immune response because your brain has paired okay i 
drink this thing. It causes this immune response. Therefore, I get better. So then the taste of it alone causes you to get better. Interesting stuff. And then drug tolerance. So we're going to talk about drug tolerance as an example of classical conditioning. So here the condition stimulus would be injection or the new, yeah, the neutral stimulus would be injection. The unconditioned stimulus would be drug entering the brain. And then the conditioned response would be the body goes into defense against the drug. So when a person takes a drug, when they ingest a drug, your body is going to act in defense of that drug. It's going to try to block it, okay, naturally. That's a natural process. Now, when a person continues to take drugs over and over and over again, the body is going to be stimulating those defensive um, activities. And so it's going to block a lot of its effects, which is why a person who's a chronic drug user has to take more and more and more to feel the same high because your body is naturally responding to um, the drug and train your brain. So let's say the drug injection produces a condition response that resembles the unconditioned response. So the body's defense is against the drug. As a result, as soon as the person starts the injection, so just getting that needle out before the drug enters the body, the body is already starting its effects to, to block the drug and the drug will have less effect and the body develops tolerance. Now, really interestingly, a lot of the times when people die of drug overdoses, it's due to them being in a different setting than when they usually use the drugs which causes a different bodily reaction. So let's say a person always uses drugs at their home. Um, that environment is its own kind of conditioned stimulus as well. And so what can happen is, let's say they go do that at a park instead of their home. Because their body is in a new environment, their brain is registering new environment, they might take the same exact amount that they normally would, but because of this new environment, um, the body is responding in a very different way, which can lead to overdose. That's not all the time, but that's sometimes. It can happen. Okay, now, Pavlov's influence on other psychologists, this guy, to the right, he's John Watson, who was a super famous psychologist. So John Watson, he was inspired by Pavlov, and he believed that human emotions and behaviors are basically a bundle of conditioned responses. He basically taught that, like, you need to not coddle your, coddle your children. You need to just, you know, it's all about behavior. Punishment, you know, those kind of things. Um, so... Watson's infamous for this experiment called the Little Albert experiment. And let's just get this off the bat. This is highly, highly unethical. This is not right what he did um, and would not be approved by an IRB today. So Little Albert was this little chubby baby who was afraid of loud noises originally, which most babies are. If you start making a ton of loud noise around a baby, they're going to get afraid. Okay. So afraid of loud noises, not a white rat. Now, Watson and his colleague, Rosalie Reiner, who he would eventually marry, um, they would show the baby the white rat. And right as the baby would reach to touch it, they would strike a steel bar with a hammer, which would cause a loud noise. OK, so this baby is learning that white rat equals loud noise, which makes me scared. So then the baby, after seven times of them doing this, Albert, the little baby, would just cry at the sight of the rat without the noise, meaning he made the association that rats were scary. Unfortunately, little Albert generalized this fear to not only the sight of the white rat, but a rabbit, a white dog, and a seal skin coat. So white kind of fluffy things he was afraid of. And what they found later um, in researching Albert as he grew up, um, little Albert developed a lifelong fear of dogs and ex extinction occurred for the other fears, um, but he did have this fear of dogs. 
based off of this original thing. So Watson basically traumatized this baby in in the uh, in the goal of learning about classical conditioning in humans, which is highly, 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 highly unethical. But that's kind of an example of how that can happen with little kids. And that's where we're going to end today. Um, I hope you took good, good notes. Rewind it, rewatch it if you need to. And we will talk about operant conditioning next time. See ya.